sex, money, <laughs> politics, happiness. Let's talk about something interesting. <laughs> Poetry. Uh, now, I, you know, I know all of you are familiar with the custom in our society, which is that when a poet speaks in public in mixed company, which is to say economists, philosophers, uh, lawyers, uh, he is supposed to apologize for his arts, you know, which is considered in a, the kind of, in a cultural sense, a sort of special Olympics. Uh, you know, the, uh, uh, I uh, decline to make such an apology. Uh, it is clear to me that poetry is one of those central activities that make us human. Poetry is the most concise, expressive, and memorable way in which we have uh, to use words to describe the world in which we live to others, to ourselves. Uh, and as long as we continue to use words between ourselves, even to God, poetry remains an essential human art. Uh, let's just begin with the poem just so that you, in case you've forgotten what one sounds like. Uh, I wanted to choose something by a pagan, and uh, uh, I think almost everyone except for, you know, who's not wearing a white robe except for Kevin Starr might not know the Latin poems that I would quote. So this is one by Callimachus. Uh, he is mourning the death of a poet named Heraclitus, not the pre-Socratic Heraclitus, just a run-of-the-mill Heraclitus, uh, whose, whose poems were nicknamed nightingales. They tell me, Heraclitus, they tell me you were dead. They brought me bitter news to hear and bitter tears to shed. I wept as I remembered how often you and I tired the sun with talking and sent him down the sky. And now that you are buried, my dear old carrion guest, a handful of gray ashes, long, long ago at rest, still are thy pleasant voices, thy nightingales awake, for death who taketh everything, them he cannot take. What poetry does is create a spell which takes all of the protective surfaces that we push, uh, protect ourselves from the world to relax those so that we actually engage with an idea, an experience, an image with the fullness of our humanity. Uh, there's been a lot of mournful language and ideas in this session, and by God, I, you know, I do the same thing myself, uh, but I am firmly convinced that Catholicism lost its authority, lost its power to speak in the world the moment that the average person walked into a church and no longer f encountered beauty in the architecture, in the music, in the decorations, in the liturgy, a music that embodied the mysteries of the church, the truths of the church. Uh, we can talk philosophy, we can talk law, we can talk economics, we can talk science. Those are magnificent, powerful, abstract virtues. But most of us, nearly all of the time, encounter the world as a holistic thing. We encounter it in a way which doesn't separate between how we understand it intellectually, emotionally, physically, imaginatively, intuitively. Uh, and it's those experiential things. For that reason, art is essential to us in being able to speak that which we know is of incomparable value and truth not simply to artists, but to everyone. Now, of the arts, poetry is, uh, I was told when I came, you know, by a commentator that poetry was one of the minor arts, by which they meant it had the smallest budget. Um, and alas, that is true. Uh, 
Here I can show you my wallet. Uh, but poetry, I think, is the test case. It is the oldest of the human arts that we still practice. It is primal. Uh, it is aboriginal. And it comes from a time where what we think of as song, dance, and poetry were one art. Words physically, rhythmically delivered to communicate things. Which means that as Catholics, we must take art seriously, beauty seriously, and I regret to inform you, even poetry. Uh, now, surely the very topic, you know, what is Catholic poetry, would have sent shivers through the spines of at least half of this audience, uh, some of which had the prudence to leave. Uh, and we could argue about what each of those things mean. I, I prefer to take the Justice Potter Stewart approach uh, and say that, you know, poetry, we, we all, you know, I can't define it, but we all recognize it when we see it. Uh, <laughs> but it's the Catholic part of poetry that's, uh, that's hard to define. I think that when we talk about Catholic poetry, Catholic literature, Catholic art, we're talking about six or seven things at once. And I just want to take that list. And surely we can all agree that one of the glories of Catholicism is our ability to make lists. The seven deadly sins, uh, the th three supernatural virtues. No faith is better at enumerating uh, truths than we are. Uh, and so let me enumerate some of these things. The first thing is, if you went to Dante or Chaucer, uh, Ronsard, Ariosto, they really wouldn't understand what you meant by Catholic poetry. Because if you're a European and you're writing poetry, you're Catholic. Uh, and so what, what it means is just you're writing poetry out of your culture. This only becomes a meaningful you know, concept to have to define in any sense uh, after the Reformation. And once again, to define again now after this secular Reformation that we are so sadly in the midst of. So you could say it's Catholic poetry written by Catholics, which means everything from Dante to Francois Villon, you know, writing a poem to the Virgin Mary, you know, while he's waiting a death sentence. Uh, you could, uh, and I think that's a good way of beginning, but let's par it down. You could sort of say it's poetry written by Catholics about Catholicism. That, I think, gets us into trouble. Most of us must have, uh, at least the old Catholic homes, have grown up in a, in a home or a school in which they had anthologies of Catholic poetry. And I just took one of the ones that was on my shelf, and some of the, the titles you see, Easter Thoughts, The Bird of Jesus, uh, The Housewife's Prayer, uh, The Grandeur of Mary, Hymn to the Guardian Angel, or my, fa my favorite one, Ireland, Mother of Priests. Uh, uh, and, and this is notion is sort of, of you know, pious poems about pious subjects. And that is indeed Catholic poetry. It's not the Catholic poetry that interests me much. What uh, I think Catholic poetry is is really three things, uh, one of which we can sort of discard as not being terribly germane. It's poetry by Catholics either about Catholicism, more interestingly about the world itself, because I think, you know, as Mary reminds us, as Thomas reminds us, that to see reality uh, is to see, in a sense, the reality of God, the reality of our faith, however we may conceptualize it. And then there's the kind of poetry written by ex-Catholics condemning the Catholic Church, a very burgeoning genre uh, at the moment. But uh, what interests me is the notion that if we are Catholics, if we are raised in Catholicism, if we have a Catholic worldview, we can be, uh, in a sense, writing a poem about legumes, uh, and our Catholicism, in a sense, will come through it. That we have, and as it were, a distinct way of looking at the world and articulating uh, the world. So what I thought I would do is just say, what is this vision of existence? What is this attitude uh, towards life that permeates, the con the, in a sense, the consciousness of a Catholic poet? It's not a subject matter. It is, in a sense, a kind of set of, of perceptive um, faculties which allow us to see the world. And I want to describe this vision to you is essentially in 
maybe nine aspects. You could probably, you know, um, go to 10, 12, or whatever. I, I tend to think Catholicism is at its strongest when it enumer enumerates things uh, with no more numbers than we have fingers. I mean, even the apostles ran into this problem. They had to name two of them James and kick one of them out. Um, <laughs> the, the first one, an aspect of Catholic poetry, Cath really I think of all Catholic art, is we live in a fallen world. Uh, as creatures bearing the burden of original sin, we feel instinctively there is a distance between the world which we know for which we were created and the world in which we currently live. There is, and as it were, you can see it in more elegantly expressed, a difference between what it is we know we should do and what it is we find ourselves doing. Secondly, our life is a journey or a pilgrimage. Uh, you know, it would be, I don't know any of your names, but I could, I could think I could, you know, basically uh, encompass everybody in this room by, by greeting you all as sinners and all as pilgrims. Uh, that this journey has many stages, but it is ultimately and inevitably towards the four last things. Uh, this pilgrim is all, pilgrimage is also mysterious. We may plan every step meticulously, but we constantly realize that the course of this pilgrimage is beyond our control. Uh, redemption is not instantaneous uh, and permanent. Uh, it is a constant process. In this, I disagree uh, with the missionary Baptists uh, and often my wife. Um, thirdly, our experience of the world is sacramental. This is really at the center of the importance of art itself. Uh, our world and our lives are full of outward signs that indicate inward change, inward grace, uh, or because that we live in the fallen world, the absence of grace. There is a kind of dark, you know, sort of sacrament, as it were. These signs, in a sense, that we are missing something. The materi materiality of the world is not an illusion. It is not an evil. Uh, it is not in any sense inferior to the things of the spirit, but it is perfect in itself. Uh, to use the metaphors, it is both a lamp and a mirror uh, for us to discern our pilgrimage. Fourth, the, we experience life in a mysterious double sense. There's a school of 17th century religious poetry which is called metaphysical, uh, uh, that which is on top of the physical world. But I would maintain that all Catholic poetry, even when it appears to be simplest, is metaphysical. Uh, that we simultaneously experience those realms of existence that are visible and invisible, temporal and eternal, and indeed the great strength of the Catholic tradition is our belief in the coexistence and the continuity of the living and the dead, the past and the present. This, I think, is at the very center of the Catholic imagination. Uh, it's one of the reasons we have this long view. I mean, uh, you know, Catholics always have a 2,000-year perspective, at least as far back uh, to Caesar and Christ. And uh, this um, changes, I think, how we experience, and I think Mary talked about this, both suffering, suffering uh, poverty, uh, all of these subjective states because we see them in a different perspective than purely the material. Five, uh, here perhaps I am in a minority nowadays, there is evil in the world. And that evil has power and allure. To live is to sin, and our challenge is to resist corruption and despair. To be a Catholic poet is uh, not necessarily to be a saint. Look at some of the greatest Catholic poets, Villon, Baudelaire. Uh, 
the recognition of the glamour of evil, to quote the baptismal ceremony, is a clarification of what it means to live in a fallen world and the means of our redemption. To recognize our own imperfection is necessary as a precondition, uh, even though redemption is beyond our control, I think is a precondition for our reception of any sort of redemptive grace. So I, I would say let's all give at least three cheers for Catholic guilt. Uh, six, the great spiritual truths. And this is where I think I am perhaps at odds with many Catholic in in intellectuals. I believe that the great, the greatest, the most central spiritual truths are experienced as incarnate, are experienced most readily, most naturally as incarnate. We are not angels. We live in a physical world which we experience with our body and our soul, which are and should be inseparable. We experience existence through our bodies. Truths need to be embodied for us to understand them fully. We do not despise the material world. We try to understand its glory. Seventh, our outlook tends to be more universal than nationalistic. Catholic means universal. Uh, and Catholics are, by their nature and upbringing, international. They take this long historical review, and Catholics, uh, poets, tend to position themselves across cultures and across ages. Poetry is a universal art. Anthropologists have never discovered any people, no matter how remote or isolated, who have, do not practice poetry at the center of their culture. The notion uh, that a poem should be accepted as transformative, uh, well, let me move in that a little bit differently. Um, think of this in terms of who is the central Catholic poet for Americans, for Italians, for British, uh, for Japanese, it's Dante. Uh, this is a poet who speaks creates a universal story uh, 800 years ago in a language that you know very few people, uh, who don't like opera at least, speak. But Dante is a presence across those cultures in the same way uh, that Roman culture, Palestinian culture, uh, you know, from 4,000 BC to, to, to uh, the birth of Christ is a presence, Hebrew culture. Uh, this is part of the Catholic literary worldview. The universal, the historical uh, awareness of what your art is, not for just a time and place, but in a sense for a broader perspective. Eighth, Suffering is much of what it means to be human, and it can be accepted as redemptive. The notion uh, that pain should be accepted as transformative and redemptive rather than an affliction uh, is not a universal cultural uh, acceptance, but it's something that is central to Catholicism, and you see it uh, everywhere in Catholic literature, from Dante to Graham Greene, from Flannery O'Connor to Baudelaire. What is, in a sense, the posture towards suffering? Is it redemptive or is it damning? And finally, ninth, the possibilities of grace and redemption are always present in our existence even if we ignore them. Redemption may not be certain, but it is certainly available. We sense the presence of grace in things both large and small. I mean, a way I, I think is that redemption uh, is not an outcome. <laughs> it's always a potential. Uh, the, there's other things that one could say 
If I was going to add a tenth, it would really come out of Augustine's City of God and say that I think that Catholic artists have always uh, believed that in addition to the city of man, which we spent so much time talking about, there is always and everywhere an invisible and eternal city coexisting of people who have chosen, in a sense, to live by the laws of God. That indeed, this is uh, a city which has a very large, albeit shabby, uh, neighborhood called art. That what the artist is doing is providing a momentary manifestation of what the city of God looks like. Its most permanent form is architecture, uh, which is why it's central, and I think, to our sense of what it means to be Catholic, of creating the space in which we celebrate it to the greatest degree. But part of it is poetry, to give us language by which we can articulate, not conceptually, not legalistically, but in a way which summons it, what it means to be alive in the presence of the divine. I thought I would end by, a, by giving you one poem, probably by a poet you've never, never heard of, or some of you have, but most of you probably not, Roy Campbell, a South African. Uh, this is a poem that he wrote shortly before he became a Catholic. He was a convert. He was living in Provence in France. Uh, he had a boat and he would go out fishing with the village fishermen during the night and they would come back. And it's called Mass at Dawn. But he's using mass, I think, almost as a pun, uh, an idea of like a mess, you know, a table laden with food. It has a couple of words that may be unfamiliar with to you. Uh, they're nautical words, sane, kind of net, a key, you know, you, once you, I, you see how it's pronounced, Q-U-A-Y, key, you know, the little dock, and then bream, a kind of fish. Only 11 lines. I dropped my sail and dried my dripping sains where the white key is checkered by cool plains in whose great branches always out of sight the nightingales are singing day and night. Though all was gray beneath the moon's gray beam, my boat in her new paint shone like a bride, and silver in my baskets shone the bream. My arms were tired and I was heavy-eyed, but when with food and drink at morning light the children met me at the waterside, never was wine so red or bread so white. If the world in a sense, is an aspect of, of the divine, of the divine truth. The images of the world, uh, you know, co coexist and reinforce our, our faith. And you see this as a Catholic imagination even before he converted. The fishermen, the baskets of fish, bread and wine, the boat shining like a bride. This is the Catholic literary imagination. It is sacramental, uh, it is communitarian, it is co-natural, it is filled with imminence, uh, and it gives you this double sense of our existence. Thank you so much. I think I brought it in at 20 minutes. Uh, uh, any questions? Oh, good. I've battered you into submission. It's all oh, darn. If somebody wants one. Hi. Um, my name is Nick. I'm actually a recent graduate of the DSPT, and I got a chance to hear you talk last year. And I, I, I'm sorry. I have to bring something up you mentioned there because I think it's relevant to what you've already said. Uh, 
regarding universality, being universal. Uh, I believe, and you can maybe confirm this for me, uh, you mentioned something to the effect of reading works by younger writers, younger poets. And I believe you said that you sensed in that writing that there was a lack of a sense of place. Yeah, this is actually, I think this comes out of the essay that I wrote, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was brought up then at the, at the, the shared discussion that we had. Um, and I'm wondering how that observation of yours pairs with or might be contrasted with this universality you've spoke about. That's a very, that's a very good question. Um, Thank you. At least if I can explain it. Um, everyone who lives in the world, everyone alive at this moment is alive in some place. Uh, they are in a particular body, in a particular time, in a particular place. The reality of art, which is physical, intuitive, holistic, I think has to grow out of that engagement with the actual and be universalized outward. What I see happening, I see it not just in poetry, I see it in movies, I see it in pop music, it's globalized. There's a generic kind of product, uh, largely of prefabricated things. And, uh, and it's also beginning to creep through poetry is that people who are 24 right now have had a childhood and adolescence that's almost identical, whether they live in Scotland, Arkansas, Kyoto, uh, you know, or Pretoria. And I think it, it's, and th my wife and I have decided this year that we're going to be able to be able to name every bird that flies through our place at Sonoma County. We, in a sense, the attention to the details of the actual world. Most people can't name the tree in their front yard, uh, the bird that's sitting in it, or any of the flowers or weeds growing along the base. Everything is genericized. And that's really what I was talking about. I think it's, it's uh, fatal to art. I also think it's fatal to civic identity and you know, actual engagement with your real life. But I'm, I'm a bigot in that, in that regard. Professor Joya, um, I was also at that small gathering last year, and... And yet you came back today? I came back today to basically have you reanimate one of your statements from that smaller meeting. And that is the fact that you were talking about re, um, reanimating Catholic imagination here in the United States. If that job is to be done, well, number one, forget the bishops. They're not going to be the ones to do it. But then there was a pause, and you said it's going to happen through the laity and the Dominicans. Would you like to revisit that statement? <laughs> you, whether you like it or not, are the heirs to Thomas Aquinas, uh, who I still think, at the beginning of the 21st century, gave the most complete and compelling account of beauty's relationship to truth and humanity's relationship to beauty as a means of perceiving reality. Uh, I would love to have the Dominicans do it on their own, uh, but I think you need the numbers that the laity provide. I mean, what we've been bemoaning today, and, and there's reason to, is well, the, these things happen because of the media. These things happen. What that means basically is that, well, we sat on our butts for most of the 20th century, and now we're mad that the world hasn't gone our way. Uh, uh, you know, we make these elegant, I mean, Catholics can win arguments in philosophy all the time. And that's the only place in universities you see Catholics employed usually is in the <laughs> philosophy department. <laughs> but the trouble is that's not a, a particularly compelling way of explaining it. But I think that the Dominicans are the heirs to one of the great human legacies, not simply the, one of the great Catholic legacies, but one of the great human legacies. And you are still very alert uh, to the importance of that legacy. And I th that is where, you know, why I, I am devoted to your order. Uh, because, you know, I, I can still feel the energy. You take art seriously. But there is enormous, great is the harvest, 
but few are the workers. Uh, and it's my job as a writer and as a poet uh, to bring some people toward this harvest. Uh, the, you know, I think that people are so deeply concerned right now that it doesn't take much convincing uh, to get people to join this. Um, Kevin Starr, uh, Greg Wolf and I, in three weeks are creating a huge national literary conference at USC. We need a thousand of these gatherings, and we can change the world. You know, we must not lose faith that we can create the society in the, and the culture in which we want to live. Uh, it's a matter, really, I think, of clarity and conviction. You've piqued my interest in uh, Catholic poetry. If you were going to give us your top three must-reads, a little more contemporary than Chaucer <laughs> and Dante, what would you recommend? Well, it depends what languages you read. One of the greatest Catholic poet of the 20th century was an Italian, Mario Luzzi. In fact, when Luzzi died at 91, John Paul II you know, wrote a little appreciation. I mean, he writes in Italian, he's been well translated, Mario Luzzi, L-U-Z-I. Of course, Gerard Manley Hopkins. He had to give good press to the Jesuits, but you know, hey, you know, they deliver. Uh, you know, is really you know one of the great you know Catholic poets. Uh, this and, and this, you know, the, the, see, the trouble is, American literature and British literature are overwhelmingly the literature of Protestantism. Uh, so, but I would go back to the source and say Shakespeare. I mean, Shakespeare uh, is, you know, is Shakespeare and, and Dante, I think, are the foundational poets of Europe more so than any other, other writers. They're both Catholic. Uh, I actually spoke with my English teacher a little bit. In this poetry, uh, the dripping signs. Sa Sains, I is think. Is that the ropes? The lines. Well, this, this, those are the, the the seine nets being pulled out of out of the water, the, the dripping seines. Is what okay, I got in, that. In, in and the other need, I need a little help in that one. Uh, and silver in my basket shone the bream. I gather that's a basket of fish with the light off the yes. fish. Yeah, and well, it's. I mean, what he's doing is is taking uh, the bream, these bream, which is a you know I think a fish I've only eaten once. Uh, you know, out of the water, they're shining from the water, and what they become is wealth. I think it's an interesting poem that it is silver rather than gold, uh, you know, that is, that is symbolizing this. But once again, it's very Catholic metaphysical, which is to say that the physical object becomes a sacramental sign of another level of existence. Um, you know, and, and it also, in this case, alludes to um, you know, the, the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. And it ends with just his two daughters meeting him on the beach and having breakfast. But the breakfast, in a sense, replicates or, or suggests the Lord's Supper. So, I mean, it's, so it's, you know, it's a kind of, it's a, what interests me about this poem is it's so short, it's so straightforward, and yet almost every line uh, has, you know, a set of correspondences. Uh, that enrich and ennoble it. Dana, thank you for a very thoughtful presentation. Um, when I entered, my, my world is also the world of arts, um, and when I entered the Catholic Church in the 1970s, an adult convert, uh, the attitude, it wasn't an instruction, but the attitude was clearly that we should not identify ourselves as Catholic artists or Catholic writers or Catholic filmmakers or anything else that that was viewed as too narrow, parochial, and not in the spirit coming out of the Second Council of enculturation. In other words, we weren't s supposed to say in our own little parochial world. Given what's happened in the last quarter century, should that still be our attitude? Well, first of all, in case anybody doesn't know this, it does not help you as an artist to identify yourself as a Catholic. Um, you know. Uh, you know, it's it's at the at the best, it's considered a social disease. You know, at, you know, at, at at worst, you know, uh, you know, a kind of tremendous moral failing. But my, my motto really is that you know, Catholic artists should say we're here, we're queer, 
and we're not going away. Uh, you know, that, uh, that, that it's, there's a time, I think, where we simply have to, uh, we have to step forward. I mean, uh, if you don't witness the truth, it can't be very true to you. It can't be very important to you. Uh, and, and my experience has been, let me bring you to a different thing. When I started off as a poet, um, it seemed to me that one of the things that I wanted to do was to write in rhyme, in meter. I wanted to tell stories. Um, and these were considered taboo. You know, and, I, and the moment I began doing it, I began being attacked. Now, the interesting thing is the more you're attacked, the more famous you become. But what happened almost immediately was that the other people began saying, you know, I feel the same way. And once you begin to articulate something, it gives other people the courage to come behind it. Uh, and I believe that as Catholic writers, we need to create a big tent. Uh, I am not interested in devotional Catholic writing. I don't. I have no gift for it. I have very, no appetite for it. But I do. You know, uh, that's a possibility. But I think we have to. We have to create our own community. We have to have the conversations like today that we need to have among ourselves. Until we have them among ourselves, we're not able to articulate it beyond ourselves. Uh, create, nourish our own community. Start our own conversations, and then just see where it goes. Um, but. So I, I, I think the time has come that we have to sort of step forward and be public. Um, this is more general. Um, regarding poetry, now, the poetry that I see nowadays is um, mostly not understandable. Um, it is to be understood as music. So they say, just listen to the sound. Whereas the poetry, uh, Heraclitus and Dante and Carducci and so they, had, they were not only good sounding, but also understandable. And that is uh, the, what I miss in poetry nowadays. For example, take Heraclitus, uh, uh, Tis de Bios, Tis et Non, Ater Crises Aphrodite. I mean, what is life? What is uh, uh, sweetness without Aphrodite? And Aphrodite is not meant as, as um, the love, <laughs> charity is uh, meant like some word, something else. Okay, but anyway, it is understandable. And the same thing with Dante. Um, you know, Dante says, in the mezzo dei cammini di nostra vita, mi doveva essere una serva oscura che la diritta vera era smarrita. I mean, everybody has found himself in these situations, and it is very easy. She was quoting the opening of the Divine Comedy, for those of us who didn't recognize it. And or actually uh, Father Healy, uh, when it was the, the Mother of God, the Feast of the Mother of God, he, he cited the Paradiso, you know, Vergine Madre, Figlia del Tuo Figlio, and which is a very yeah. moving description of the Blessed Mother. And uh, I, I wish that the poetry nowadays were, was uh, not only good sounding, but also understandable. Well, what I'm saying. Um, What's the, the line from the Dies Irae, you know, when the, the judge comes and reads our sentences, which of us, you know, will, you know, basically, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but there's something, you know, which of us, you know, is actually going to make the muster. Compared to Dante, I mean, you know, which of us is going to make the muster? Uh, I mean, what you're saying is something very true, is that, uh, Almost all poetry is bad poetry, uh, you know, because it's it, you know it's it's a high wire act. You know, you're trying to, to compress things to make them powerful, memorable, and expressive. Uh, so, you know, what I was using the category poetry was, in a sense, talking about the great poetry of the past and the present, uh, but. I get books of poems every day, and I always read the first poem and the last poem in the book, and almost all of them are not very good. But that takes not an iota of, of, you know, of achievement away from Hopkins, away from Dante, from Carducci, uh, you know, from any number of, of, you know, of poets. And uh, if every age produces half a dozen poets that are of significant and enduring merit, that's a rich age. If he hadn't had a Bostonian family, he would have become one. Uh, it was hard enough for 
uh, Elliot to become a Christian, but you know, to have the same religion as the Irish maid was too much to ask for him. Uh, and I really believe that. I mean, he was, you know, he was very, very Catholic, but it was, and he couldn't go in a sense beyond the limits of his of his own culture. That being said, he is truly one of the great you know, Christian writers of the, mo of the modern period and, you know, one of the three or four best American uh, modernists. And one of the other great American modernists, Wallace Stevens, spent his entire career uh, as a poet talking about how do you find meaning in the world if you take God out of it? And he thought about it and he thought about it and on his deathbed he became a Catholic, as did Oscar Wilde. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, uh, as Wilde said, Catholicism is the only religion to die in. <laughs> um, Peter has um, another question related to your uh, seventh or eighth point. I can't remember which it was. A few years ago, I wrote a, an article on uh, science and religion in which I argued that the sacramental nature of the universe was an essential presupposition of Catholic approaches to science. But I'm wondering whether you could extend that also to your tenth point about the city of God and this, is, this question could also be directed to Mary as well. Is the notion of the communion of saints, which is essential to Catholicism, does that undergird poetry uh, as well as economics I, as sort of an antidote to what someone here talked about as the, the poison of possessive individualism? The, to my understanding of poetry, the communion of saints is central to the art. And I'll, let me explain it to you in very practical reasons. It's very, very similar to science. Uh, you are a uh, what's your background? I work in biology. Okay, but say, let's say you're a biologist. You're not going to be able to invent everything yourself. You know, you're going to go there and you're going to have all of the cumulative riches of your discipline. What poetry depends upon is that when I use a word like bread, wine, silver, boat, dawn, uh, that it evokes all of the previous uses of that word so that how poetry operates, unlike science, is that two plus two equals eight uh, because everything gains, gains resonance beyond it. There's a little poem. I was thinking of beginning with this. Uh, it's only a few lines long, but about this, you know, we're already in spring in California, you know, God bless us, uh, by Frost. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest you to hold, her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. You know, and that's a moment where the gold, leaf, Eden, spring, all of these things, you know, have double, triple, quadruple meanings. I came across a wonderful quote uh, by Wilhelm Grimm, who's writing in the middle of the 19th century about how people are always finding lessons from fairy tales. And he says that all, you know, that fairy tales allow themselves to multiple interpretations because they come from life itself. And, and to which, and it return to life itself. So just as you can have multiple interpretations on any natural phenomenon or any aspect of life by depending on where you're looking at it, that is how literature operates. And it does that through that kind of, you can call it intertextuality, but it is in a sense the communion of saints. The notion that your poem exists in a human continuity, living and dead, in which you honor those. And that's actually the only good part about being a poet, frankly, uh, is that when you're depressed, you can talk to Dante, you can talk to Catullus, you can talk to Shakespeare, and when you call them at 2.30 in the morning, they answer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, just, just a short uh, apostrophe. And you'll forgive me, Dana, for being the eternal optimist. I think when we talk about being concerned about the role of Catholic writers in the contemporary moment, it's a little easy for us to, to feel like we're in the catacombs and that, uh, that we're not publicly accepted. 
or that Christianity is not in the public square. I think it's important to remember that people like Marilyn Robinson are winning the Pulitzer Prize. I, I think it's also significant that the winner of this year's uh, or the previous year's National Book Award for Poetry is a writer named Mary Zibist for a volume called Incarnadine. Now, if you think about that word, obviously it's going to raise Shakespeare in your mind, multitudinous seas incarnadine, but it's also a deliberate play on the incarnation. And the entire metaphoric structure of the book is based on the Annunciation. And the picture on the front of Mary Zibbitt's National Book Award winning book, coming from her Catholic background, is the Shestello Annunciation uh, in, in the Uffizi. Um, and she speaks forthrightly about her Catholic vision, her Catholic background. So just at the moment when we're tempted to uh, back sideways into the catacombs, I think it's important to, to give ourselves a couple slaps and realize that if we create the work, if we make the work today, it will be recognized. Uh, you don't find me going into the catacomb. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>